The illustrious Jabba bids you welcome. <laughs> I'm going to regret this. I'm Pete Mitchell. He's Peyton Jones. And this is the Church Planner Podcast. Brought to you by Church Planner Magazine. Hey, Church Planner, welcome back to, and this is so weird, Church Planner Podcast. So weird because I don't normally kick us off. My partner in crime, my co-host, the better looking one of the two of us is not here today. He is actually on uh, vacation. Um, He shouldn't have a vacation. I don't think he earned it. I don't think we should let him go on one, but that's where he is today. And so I'm here holding down the shop. And of course, when Pete Mitchell's not here, we have to get an equally great man on. And so... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> We're continuing this series today about people I respect and I've learned a lot from, and that is Ralph Moore, who is on the show today. Ralph, welcome onto the show. Thanks, man. It's good to be here. Well, Ralph, you know, uh, you're kind of like a guy that doesn't need a lot of introduction. I mean, you have uh, written multiple books. One of them I'm holding in my hand. Uh, starting a new church. You have written a ton of others. You are on the Exponential team now that it's public uh, and out of the bag that I also am coming on to the Exponential team. We're partners in crime in that way, and we become good friends, Andrea and Ruby and us. And uh, But you're also somebody that I greatly respect. A little bit of background about Ralph, and he hates this, but I'm going to do it anyways. Um, Ralph was the founder of Hope Chapel. Um, He was up in Hermosa Beach. He has spanned a ministry uh, over the course of 50 years, uh, about five decades, um, Hawaii, um, up up north uh, in, um, oh, why am I not, uh, where the Lost Boys took place. Why am I blanking out on that, Ralph? (laughs) I was in the San Fernando Valley for a while and in in, uh, Hermosa Beach for like 12 years. And then Hawaii. Yeah. 35. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, it, it's amazing. And you're now back. You're, you're an SD in my neck of the woods. And, uh, but you, you know, over the years, I mean, uh, you have just discipled a massive number of people, which I think right now when Exponential was looking for uh, a level five multiplier, they thought they'd come up with, you know, uh, scores of them. And it turns out when it came back, they, 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 they were basically like, look, after exhausting our extensive network, we have come back with, we found one and it's Ralph Moore and, uh, you know, and, and level five multiplier, by the way, for the audience is when you have reproduced to the fourth generation. So you have planted churches that have planted churches that have planted churches that have planted churches. And you're in the fourth generation. That's the definition. Well, for you, it wasn't just, you know, we've, we've planted churches like that. It was, it came back that it was 20, am, am I right on this? The number, was it 2,700? No, it was 20. When we did the study, which was, all it was, was I, I got a hold of everybody that was, a Hope Chapel person in, you know, they don't all use the name, but they came from us in my contact list. And I just started following it out as far as it would go. And it came out to 2,317. And then by the time I got to the exponential deal a few days later, or a few weeks later, it was 2,322. That was like four or five years ago. We're still finding churches that we didn't know existed. So uh, we know it's over 2,400, but, but, you know, like I was in Japan last year and discovered seven churches that I had no knowledge of uh, in three different cities. I mean, coming from three different cities. I, there are, I mean, a couple more in the United States, one's in the Philippines, but like one came out of Naha, Okinawa, and two out of, you know, it's just, it, it just keeps going. Once, once the ball gets rolling, I have nothing to do with it <laughs> other than, you know, I write a little blog, do a podcast, try to keep the fires burning, but you know, it's the Holy Spirit. It's not, it's not really a work of man once it gets going. Yeah, I love that, Ralph. And I love that, 
you know, that's kind of your heart. And, you know, really I would expect nothing, nothing less than that, right? That um, you don't look back and pat yourself on the back and go, yeah, yay me. Right. But, uh, yeah. but you know, you, you and Ruby have, <clears throat> you're quite a team. She's your partner in crime. I, I always like to, to, to quote, um, uh, Fred and Ginger, uh, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, who were dance partners. That's what it feels like in ministry a lot is, is your wife doesn't often, you know, get the credit for being a part of that journey with you all those years. But, uh, Ginger Rogers once said, you know, just remember everything Fred did, I did backwards and then high heels. And so, um, the, the, the two of you over, you know, the, all these decades, I mean, the, the amount of times you've opened your homes and, you know, just let out together and took those risks together. And uh, of course, discipleship, that, that would have been a part of the process. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, uh, how you have become, and I think I just tipped my hand there a little bit by, by flashing the D word, but, uh, tell me a little bit about how you have, um, really become a level five multiplier. Uh, well, I, think, I mean, everything starts with making disciples that you trust. Um, disciple making and I think we finally are beginning to get off the concept of discipleship that's drink a cup of coffee and pray a little bit in the morning into you know living life together and, and sharing what you know of Jesus and and uh, ministry with another person and uh, you know I, I talked to a lot of pastors a lot of guys kind of give me the run around that well you know I don't do disciple making I, I delegate that to somebody on my staff and I think that's absolutely wrong. Yeah, so I, I think that we've got to work with people that we trust, and that really comes from one-on-one -on -one disciple making. And you know, as a as a lead pastor, you know, I started several churches from three from scratch. A couple of them grew to a couple thousand people. Uh, one to the last one to about three hundred people. So I've seen this work at all sizes, but uh, we we would. Um, raise up disciples as mini church pastors. And by that, what we meant was kind of, we saw Sunday church as a convention of churches and what we called the mini church, people meeting in homes was the church. And so the leadership was pastoring and making disciples at the root of this. We're, we're using the Sunday Bible teaching. And then we come together and we're asking questions, three questions. Uh, what did the Holy spirit say to you while the pastor was talking, which might be, a little different than what the pastor said. Uh, what are you going to do about it, which suddenly you're putting your life on the line instead of it being an intellectual discussion. We're talking about interacting with the Spirit and now with your friends because you're confessing, I'm going to do this, and then how can we help you, which kind of brings spiritual gifts into it. So I'm discipling a guy, and I, I watch him disciple others to the point where he's raising up his own disciples to take his place and go start something as he starts something new. I watch a guy do it two or three times. There's a high level of trust. Uh, I, I know this person. I've assessed this person. Uh, I, I'm, I'm personal with him because at the same time we're doing this, um, we, we would organize our church to where we had groups of mini church pastors and each staff member who's also leading the mini church is also leading one of those groups and I'm discipling the staff. So, we we got this thing going where from different angles, we're pretty tight with each other relationally. So by the time a guy can start three or four mini churches, we start looking at him as a potential church planter. And, you know, once, you know, we, we like the fire and, and get the talk going and spend a lot of time together, I would actually spend whoever was going to go out the door to plant a church, no matter where they originated or grew in the disciple making chain, I'd spend the last six months with them at least once a week, just hanging out, talking about whatever they want to talk about, and then try as best I could to coach after they'd gone. And so there's high degree of trust. So it becomes kind of a no-brainer for us. Uh, what is a stumbling block for a lot of leaders? Uh, a lot of people are now getting into the idea of planting churches. And, and, and thankfully, some of the mega churches are really starting to, and you know, those guys, if they start cranking, they can really do it although most church planting is done by smaller congregations. But um, the, the, the stumbling block is that we get beyond that first generation. Most people 
are worrying about branding. They're worrying about what they would call quality control. In some cases, they're worrying about the Sunday service looking like perfection. I don't really care about any of that. You know, our guys yeah. call the church whatever they want to call it. Yeah, yeah. You know, we just don't, we're not into branding. We're not into perfection. So if I believe in the character of a man, then why would it be wrong in my sight for him to go launch another church that maybe looks a little different than him and certainly different than me? And then to move that on out, you know, we know one place where it goes nine generations deep. And that's really where the gold is, where, you know, people are free to do whatever they want to do. Control and trust. Yeah, control is the number one thing that actually kills a church, a church plant. You know, you, if you're empowering and enabling, you know, then then it's, you know, it's freeing. And like you said, there's the absolute freedom. But uh, I'll tell uh, sending churches, you know, you have to realize that the worst thing you can do for this church planner is attempt to control uh, what, what's happening. Because like you said, you're worried about the branding, you're worried about quality control, you're worried about, you know, let them go. Just yeah. l- let the planner go. Um, so just for a, a little bit of a definition of terms, when you say that once they've multiplied the many churches, a few of those, that you look at them as a planter, some people would say, oh, isn't that the same thing? But I think what you're saying is um, when you were the pastor at Hope, you were saying, no, now I want you to set out somewhere and start a bunch of mini churches that cluster together. Is that, is that what you're saying there? Oh yeah. Yeah. And you know, and today we're, we're using this term micro church, which is beginning to, to, to take some, you know, hold in America. I think we're, we're looking at some financial crisis that's coming toward the church. 70% of all giving is by people who are now over 53 years old. Uh, we're not going to see church in the future the way we've seen it in the past. Uh, the, the whole culture is kind of, turned its back on Christianity, we're going to have to be doing micro churches. But I think we're going to still see the kind of hub and spoke thing where somebody goes and, and, and they get a little, you know, some ground under them and, and there starts to be, you know, kind of using our model that we used in the past of the mini church, but then we expanded it to church plants. And um, today we'd, instead of be thinking about, we're going to send guy out and, and try to shoot for 150 people the first week, we're going to probably shoot for 20, 25 people. And, and the guy keeps his job or his career or whatever. We could plant a lot more churches a lot faster. And we've watched some of those, you know, smaller church plants turn into a thousand people. Almost anything goes. Yeah. One of, one of the church planners in the network that I founded, you and I were talking because he loved your book. I handed him a few books when he first got started, he was actually the first guy I trained, first person to ever read Church Zero. But he read your book out of the stack of books, and he said that was the best. And you know, it was um, starting new churches, which we mentioned earlier. If you haven't grabbed it, everybody grab it. But um, the the thing is, is that um, he is on his fourth church plant as a Bible. He's a chimney sweeper, and um, he's part of New Breed, and everybody in New Breed is is you know, bivocational because like we have a barber who, you know, he, uh, they come in, they sit in his barber chair and they start just, he says, it's weird. It's like, I'm a, a, a Catholic priest. They lean back in that chair and they start confessing everything to me. And he said, I would never, ever leave this job. And he goes, what happens is I have like a two tiered system where I lead him to Christ on Friday nights at the cigar lounge. And then they come into the church and he says, so it's this like three tiered thing, you know, by the time they've come to church, they've already been meeting with me outside of that. And, you know, so, and, and it's the same for me and Ralph, like I, I was about 17 years, um, by vocational, um, still to this day. Um, you know, like Paul says, I don't want to be a burden at the churches. I remember when I joined North American mission board, they were like, well, here's some money. And I'm like, cool, we'll hire another guy. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, and, and, you know, team leadership, all that stuff. So um, it's really exciting to hear because the, the thing about you, Ralph, that, that I think is a little bit different is, you know, Hope Chapel was no small deal. I mean, it had an amazing, it was, it was kind of the equivalent of Calvary Chapel, right? It, it, it was a big movement. Um, and yet, uh, here you are, you're thinking 
like a church planner. And I need to ask you something I've never asked you is, why are you not thinking like some stuffy uh, mega church pastor that's at the top of an empire who, you know, is like, hey, more satellite campuses with television screens broadcasting me. You know, it's better than Ralph Moore. 30 campuses looking at Ralph Moore. How come you're not that guy? What what changed for you? I gave myself permission to die. No matter what happens, you're either going to die or retire or something. And if if all there is is you, you know, I, I grew up in the, I'm pretty old. I grew up in the 1950s. And coming out of World War II, there was a, a movement toward the gospel in America. 1956 was the was the largest. It was a peak church attendance until the Jesus movement hit in the 1970s. And so church grew like crazy from the 40s till 1956 and then began to shrink. And so by the time I'm in high school, which is in their early 60s, and then when I'm in, in a Bible college, just before the Jesus movement, uh, we're looking at, 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 at you know, they weren't mega churches, but auditoriums, some of them that would hold a thousand people, because people kind of in those days were into like one service on a weekend. And so they'd underutilize real estate, which frustrated me. Even as a kid, I'm, it's like, what's this waste? I don't get this. But um, I hear, hear things like this. Some guy dies and the church just shrinks. Hmm. And then people say, oh, what a wonderful leader he was because, I mean, nobody could take his place. And I'm thinking, what a failure he was that he hmm. could prepare somebody to take his place. And then wow. as a kid, I mean, I was 19 years old and, I had there was no books ever at that point on church planting or church multiplication. Uh, we we were beginning to see the charismatic movement generate some mega churches, and then the Jesus movement came along, and Calvary Chapel came up, and the Vineyard, and we were kind of like the little kids in the Jesus movement. The, the real growth of Hope Chapel happened after that movement was over. But as a 19 year old, I was working in a church in Oregon, just volunteering. I I had a, a job sanding bowling alleys, and it was paying for my college education. And so I was uh, in, in the churchyard. We got in a new property. It was a brand new church. I went there uh, when when a guy took over a dead church, basically with twenty seven people, and and I stayed with him one summer. And I remember the the two digits reversed. My last Sunday there, there were seventy two people, and that went on to be a church of about nine thousand. It's called East Hill Church, and. Gresham, Oregon. Hmm. But I was there in the beginning and I'm pulling weeds in the yard and I go to college in California, but I enjoy the Oregon coast. I grew up there. And so I'm thinking over my lifetime, here's my, my plan. Either I'm going to move, I'm going to start five to seven churches. And the, the deal will be, I'll, I'll go to a place, I'll start a church, I'll, I'll disciple some young kid, I'll send him to a Bible college, he'll graduate, he'll come back, he'll take over the church. And I'll move up the road to the next place. And so I had this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a kid. I'm 19 years old. I'm not, I haven't thought a whole lot of things out, but <laughs> I'm kind of planning and not thinking about the money or, or where's that coming from or, or, or the possibility of being bivocational. Just thinking I'm probably never going to pastor a really big church if I could reach an awful lot of people if I'd start a bunch of them. And I never thought about multiplication. This is a simple addition model, one after the other. But that kind of junk was in my heart when I got started. And, you know, it just turned into something over the years. And uh, I, I just wish more people would think that way. So that that was something that God had, had clearly uh, earmarked you for when you were young. I mean, that was just a work that... Like you said, you hadn't thought it out. You didn't know how it was going to work. But I, I suppose it was probably a bit like the Apostle Paul when he was saved. Jesus gives him that kind of glimpse like, hey, you're going to open the eyes of the Gentiles. Then tell him how. <laughs> it's yeah. just he's got that calling. And, you know, he's he's for 12 years doing what he can in Syria and Tarsus. And then he gets that knock on the door. So um, uh, what, what were some... I, I guess if I have Ralph Moore on here, um, it's kind of like I need to ask, what were some of the major breakthroughs for you in um, ministry where it just everything kind of changed? And then I'm going to ask you the opposite question is what were some of the biggest struggles or roadblocks that you had in your ministry? Um, 
the the the, the biggest breakthrough came we we were um we're in the jesus movement we were we're you know kind of big for our area we're you know in a in an area where we're we're bordered by industry on one side by people who are ethnically and culturally very different on two other sides you know one place there it's a real poverty area and we're just definitely middle class but we're hippies um and then on, on another side it's real wealthy people so I mean, it's just a small little place that we're working at in Manhattan, Hermosa Beach. And we were in a in a community center. We had a little church building. We we're kind of strung out for about three blocks along Manhattan Beach Boulevard. And we got this old bowling alley. We, bowling alley. we remodeled it for a church building. And suddenly we're on a, a really well-known intersection in L.A. County. We're overlooking the ocean. We're uptown. We grow from like 400 to 800 people overnight. And it was horrible. I mean, all these people, there was a Rolls Royce in the parking lot. And, you know, I just sort of made it my business to never know who owned that car because I just don't want to treat anybody different than anybody else. And so there's all these rusty Volkswagens and BMWs now and Mercedes, and it's crazy. And we're shrinking real fast because we're a church of strangers. And so the breakthrough was when we kind of, we hired a guy to come and assess what we're doing. And he came up with basically, you're, you don't have a small group ministry. What we had in the, at the height of the Jesus movement, we had more people going to Bible studies than coming to church on the weekend. And I mean, we were everywhere. I was doing one in a missile plant. I had to go through people picketing the Vietnam War to get in there. It's crazy. But all that had all died with the kind of the passing of the Jesus movement. And now uh, we invented this thing where we'll get together and we'll talk about the pastor's message. And at first it was very clumsy. It was very intellectual. And we soon moved away from that. Uh, but we, we, were, we had pent up need. Uh, we had a, a, a midweek prayer meeting where we'd have about 80, 85 people show up. The first week we did the things in homes, uh, we threw away the prayer meeting. We had 365 people come, and we tried to fit them into seven houses, by the way. That was a bit of a problem. But um, <laughs> all of a sudden we had a mechanism that we didn't understand, but a mechanism that, uh, you know, we were running a Bible school that we called the Pastor Factory, and we real and we soon realized that people are, are dropping out of ministry because we're giving them so much homework. And they continued the pastor factory after I left the church, but the real pastor factory was the mini church. That was the place where we're developing the leaders who would multiply. Another breakthrough, and I, I don't often talk about this. I'm not sure if I ever really have talked about this because of the kind of questions that you get in interviews, but one major breakthrough was me moving to Hawaii because mm. Zach Nazarian, who took over the church in Hermosa Beach, continued to plant churches. I mean, for a little while, it was iffy. He wasn't quite sure if it was God's call for him or not. And, and then we both came to the conclusion it's God's call for every church to multiply itself. And so by the time we had put out about 60 churches from Hawaii, they'd put out another 60 from, from where they're at in Hermosa Beach. And so this movement that starts with us back in 1971 in Manhattan Beach, by 1983, when I moved, to Hawaii, there's two very strong streams now of multiplication, us in Hawaii and, and Zach where he's at, and, and pretty soon the thing's reaching its arms around the world. And then there's actually a third thing, and I, I, I don't even know how this really came to be, but somewhere along the line, I, I do remember that I, a guy would fuss at me to go to Mongolia, and I just kept resisting him and resisting, and finally I went, and I was already doing quite a bit of travels with the Hope Chapels, but that was beginning to die down. You kind of get to a point where the guys that are out there actually doing something are, are doing it on their own. They don't need me anymore. And the ones who aren't going to do it, me beating them up and, and trying to motivate them is kind of a waste because they're not going to. And so I begin to shift gears to where probably the last 20 years of my pastoral ministry I'm traveling uh, nine to 11 times a year, uh, mostly in Asia, uh, sometimes five times a year in Japan. That was our secondary mission field. And 
I'm helping uh, guys launch movements in countries like Nepal, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, the Philippines, Taiwan, uh, mainland China, and now in England, in Russia, in South Africa. Um, in, in actually, uh, I did a thing in Turkey once. Uh, so w those were not Hope Chapel people. And so when we start talking about 23, 2400 churches, that has nothing to do with these people because these churches didn't come out of our stream, so we never would even think of, of counting them. But, you know, it, I sort of stumbled into being able to meet a lot of wonderful leaders in other countries um, who I have no ongoing input other than just friendship emails from time to time. So, you know, a lot, God has just done a lot that's way bigger than, than any of us. That's all I can ever say. That's really cool. And I, I love that. Um, what would you give uh, as far as advice to planners starting out um, who kind of have that sense like a young, you know, 19 year old Ralph Moore that I think I'm supposed to do something. Um, I don't got it all figured out, but what would be some kind of like words of sage advice? Like, Hey, planners starting out, you know, I always like to, to, to ask people, Hey, if you could go back and tell yourself, something in time. Um, I remember uh, seeing an article once with Bono where he was going through a, a, a photojournalist had chronicled um, all these pictures of him over like 30, dec you know, 30 years, yeah. three decades. And so all these pictures, uh, it was some art gallery in Scandinavia and Bono's walking to the gallery and a reporter said to him, hey, if you could go back in time and tell that young man, he was looking at a particularly young photograph of himself. And he said, if you could tell that young man anything, what would you tell him? And without missing a beat, Bono says, you're, you were right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if, if future self, you know, if Ralph Moore today could get off the time machine, like Christopher Lloyd and back to the future, great Scott, <laughs> Ralph, we've got to save your kids. You know, what, what would, future Ralph Moore say to young 19 year old Ralph Moore and channel that into our planners today. Okay. Let me start with what I would say to that Ralph Moore. If Ralph Moore was 19 today, um, it, that Ralph Moore, I'd say you were right because I was beating my head against the wall until I got involved with exponential with everybody not wanting to give anybody away or give any money away or give any leadership away. And then the whole mega church thing hit and it got worse because everybody wanted to be, you know, big. And, and so, uh, that, that young Ralph Moore needed somebody to say, you were right. And by the way, I had a guy named Don McGregor in my life who did that really, really well for me. But to the, to the young Ralph Moore, you know, if I, if I had to go back in time to when I was 18, 19 years old and I went to college, I'd do exactly what I did because that's what you had to do. I had to go to a Bible college or a seminary to get a piece of paper or I couldn't be a pastor. And I was so naive that I, I wouldn't have known to rent a public school and start a church. I needed somebody to hand me an empty building and go, you know, what can you do here? And, and so I would do what I did. But if I, if I was talking to me today, I would say, you know, you like engineering, uh, you know, I used to think I wanted to be an architect until I discovered I really don't like modern architecture, but I, I really like tinkering with anything. I'd go become an engineer. I'd, I'd do what John Wesley said. I'd earn all, earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. And I would, I'd be able to be that person I thought of when I was 19 because I think there's always a mistake made with my life and the denomination I was in. I, I'm really good at starting a church and it, and it grows to about 900 really quickly and then to about 15, 1600. And after that, it gets difficult. And if the denomination I'd been in had thought to help me be a serial church planter, move me from city to yeah. city. And by the time we hit 900 people, we've got maybe 15 churches out there outside of our church, beside the mini churches inside. And if I yeah. could have done that hub and spoke thing in five cities in my lifetime, that would have been really wonderful as a vocational planter. But if I did it the way I'm thinking now, where I would be Bible, I'd be free to do anything. 
Right. Uh, and that, that, that's the key, isn't it? You know, Bible and team, that's, that's your freedom and your capacity. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just amazing to me to, to kind of see and hear from someone who's been kind of, you know, used in the, in, in the capacity that have been used. Um, but, but really still on the cutting edge and, um, you know, that's, not even the cutting edge, but even ahead of the curve, really, on where things are going. I believe that, you know, decades from now, Ralph, this is this will be the norm. What we're talking about, what actually there will be a return back to the first century style Christianity. But yeah. starting on a, you know, going, going, you know, I guess dialing down um, really to, to brass tacks and grassroots here. You, um, you're a discipler. I mean, I remember, you know, just very humbly you saying it at one point in a meeting that I was in where you're speaking and you said, you know, it's, it's really not rocket science. I disciple three people at a time. I've done that for 50 years. Um, and that really, uh, captured, um, my attention and captivated a thought in my heart of, wow, that's all I did for the next you know, few decades that, that, that I have left. (laughs) I mean, I'm stupid. Look at me. My, my, my face is all scarred up. I may not have that long, Um, but say I die of natural causes, that would be a really good um, thing to focus on. And of course the proofs in the pudding, the, the, the cause was discipleship. The effect is level five multiplication. Um, Tell us a little bit, what does that look like? What is your discipleship process? If I were to be discipled by Ralph Moore, um, what would that look like? Okay, for starters, um, it would be really good for whoever's listening to this, if because there's a very long answer to that question. Hmm. And, and it's a, I wrote a book called "Let Go of the Ring," which is you know my dentist when I told him I was leaving the big church in California, go to Hawaii. He he goes, "You'll never do it. The big boys never leave a big church." And I did, so I wrote a book. Uh, a, for for that church, really, its own history. But then I've added to it. It's in its sixth edition, so it's really the whole Hope Chapel story, and it's available on Amazon. And it's the signature book of my life. And it's got weird hippie pictures in it. But um, to me, it's it's always been a, about, well, or at least since 1978, maybe, about what's the Spirit saying to you? What are you going to do about it? And how can I help you? And those three questions, I've got guys all around the world now using those questions in disciple making. And so repeat those for us real quick, Ralph, just in case someone missed them. What's the Holy Spirit saying to you? What are you going to do because of what the Spirit said? And how can I help you? Individually, you can see how that plays out. In a group, it plays out in that we've looked at some content in, in the mini church in our churches. The content was a sermon. In the leadership circles, and we they were very well defined, the content was a book that I would choose. And then I also I always had what I call my three, but I had actually let it grow to seven. Uh, I, I, I would just call it my Saturday morning fanatics. I'd meet with seven guys, or never, never more than seven, and we'd read a book together, and we'd ask those three questions. So in the, in the mini church, based on what the weekend teaching was, uh, in the staff meeting and in the ensuing leaders meetings, based on a book I got all of them reading. And then with my Saturday morning guys, another book, usually a little deeper book. Uh, the, the very, very simple thing, but it's it's totally reproducible and scalable. You know, you, you could do this in a really tiny church and you'll start to see growth. You, you get people in small groups talking about, I'm going to actually do what the Holy Spirit's saying to me to do. They become accountable to each other, and stuff happens. Ministry stuff happens, but life stuff happens. It's, and that's very simple, but that's what I do. I love it. That, that's actually super exciting to me. And I mean, I've, I've actually heard you say this before, but as you were saying it today, um, my mind went back to where Jesus, you know, I, I, I just, as you said it, my mind went back to the early church, and I'm thinking, because I know Wesley had the experience meetings that were very similar. I don't think they 
quite ask those same questions, but I think there was some, some uh, common themes in there of, of what you're saying, but I could just see them in the early church asking those very questions. And then my mind went to, well, have I seen these questions? And um, in revelation where Jesus is speaking to the churches and in each one, it says, let he who has ears to hear, hear what the spirit is saying to the churches. And, and I, I love that. That's just, um, that's just, that's kind of been an aha moment for me just now. You could just, you can just picture them, you know, and then the, what are you going to do about it? Well, you know, Jesus has practical instructions for each one of those churches. This is what I'm saying. This is what you need to do about it. And, uh, yeah. And then how can I help you? I, I, I just love that. It's really cool. So, um, Ralph, what right now are you the most excited about? Because um, I see you traveling all over. I see you leading cohorts. I see you writing. I see you uh, still going to Japan. And, um, you know, uh, w- w- what's exciting you right now? Well, I'm really excited about Japan, for one thing. Japan's been a real slow thing. And when we, when we first went there, you know, they said that 3% of the people went to church. And I've been going to Japan since about 1985, and we're down to less than 1% go to church, but 3% call themselves Christians, which is a real interesting thing. And But we're seeing churches that we plant grow. And the uh, exciting thing is last year we did what we called a mini exponential. We actually used the, the Becoming Five material and, and Dave Ferguson's book, Hero Maker, and that's really caught on in Japan. And you know, in the Hope Chapels, we'll get together and on a Saturday morning and do a little one-day seminar, and about 50 people in the Tokyo area will come. In the Kansai area, the Osaka, Kobe area, it's a little smaller. So last year we did a thing in Tokyo, and we went to the, to the non-Hope Chapel affiliated churches. And, you know, our guys are going, in the beginning, they're going, I go, how many are going to come? And they go, well, we're shooting for 30. And I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. We, we do our own thing. We get 50. So let's just shoot for 100. Oh. And so they start praying for 100. 104 registered, but 155 showed up. And so we're pretty thrilled about that. And it, the way it worked was the first day, there were about 100. And the second day, all these young guys come and they snuck in. We thought it was really cool. They didn't pay. They snuck past the registration table, almost all of them. But they were there, and uh, it apparently had had gathered enough word of mouth that in one day that we grew by fifty percent. That was huge, and in Japan, anything is huge, kind of. And so we're doing it again this year. We've got really good traction. We're going to be doing it in in the Osaka Kobe area, and we're going to use the made for more material as kind of an anchor to it. Although we're going to Japanize everything. So that's one thing that's really exciting me. Another is that, you know, I live in San Diego now, and about 3% of the people in San Diego go to church. And I've seen this invasion of young church planters. In fact, uh, later this week, they're they're having to do it only every six months. They they get together. It's called San Diego Church Planting Movement. It's not yet a movement because they're just getting to know each other, and they don't meet often enough, and I'm going to go whine about that. But God's doing something here exciting, and, and I'm thrilled that I get to be a part of it in my old age. Well, San Diego eats church planters for breakfast, and I know that um, one of the, the, the things about coming on to the exponential team is um, I just said the only thing I have to do is I have to train planners. I can't stop doing that ever, and whether it's under the exponential banner doesn't matter to me. That's just what I have to do. And, um, that, that's my dream, Ralph, is you and me tag team in San Diego and we do some damage and, uh, me, you, Andrew and Ruby, we, uh, we start training this next generation up. (laughs) So, but they got to let me out of textbook dungeon first, once I get out of there, then, (laughs) then, uh, you know, then I get to do that. But, uh, well, Ralph, it has been amazing to have you on here today. And, um, thank you so much for, uh, you know, just pouring into the next generation. Um, you know, uh, 
we, we need, we really need to sit and have you on for hours and uh, not just, this has not been enough time, but um, if people want to get uh, in touch with you, I know they can go to ralphmore.net. If you guys aren't on Ralph's mailing list, definitely make sure you get on there. Um, Ralph blogs regularly. His blogs are cool. They're exciting. They're every bit of what you've gotten on here. And uh, you should definitely join uh, the mailing list because he'll mail those out to you every every chance he gets. And because he's still actively doing the stuff he, he, he talks about, it still maintains that relevancy and that cutting edge and the fresh insights and things that um, you, you don't always hear. And it's not going to be the this, this status quo. So Ralph, is there anything else uh, that you want to point people to today? Yeah, I started a podcast. And woo, woo, woo. They, again, they go to ralphmore.net, <laughs> click on podcast. I actually even put up a sermon site. It's kind of dorky right now, but I'm working on it. And um, yeah, so just ralphmore.net and it gets into pretty much everything that I'm doing and talking about. All right. And you guys might just uh, recognize a friendly voice at the beginning of that podcast. So anyways, guys, thanks for joining us today. Uh, This has been Peyton Jones and Ralph Moore reminding you, if you want to reach the ones that nobody's reaching, you need to go where nobody's going and do what nobody's doing. Thanks for joining us for another weekly episode of the Church Planner Podcast with Pete Mitchell and Peyton Jones. We'd love to hear your comments on this episode of the Church Planner Podcast. Visit us online and let us know what you thought at churchplannerpodcast.com. If you subscribe to us via iTunes and have enjoyed the podcast, leave us a positive review. The more positive reviews we receive in iTunes, the more iTunes will promote us to other church planners who would benefit from this show. This podcast is brought to you by the Church Planner Magazine, which is available in the iTunes newsstand or online via churchplannermagazine.com. Thank you.